Hi, and welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy, a proud member of the Sightcraft Network. The goal of this podcast is to demystify therapy, what can happen in therapy, and the wide array of conversations you can have in and about therapy. Through personal experiences, guests will talk about therapy, their experiences with it, and how psychology and therapy are present in many places in their lives, with lots of authenticity and a touch of humor. Here is your host, Steve Bisson. Ça fait toujours du bien d'entendre cette introduction. It's always great to hear that introduction. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 150. Yes, up to 150 of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. If you haven't listened to episode 149, it's from Mind Strong Guardians. You need to really, really listen to it. Justin and um, Austin do a great job explaining a great organization that works with military and first responders in regards to talking about their mental health. But um, episode 150 will be with Lee in. I hope I said her name right. I don't want her to yell at me. Double day. And she is someone that I've met because we're going to be doing an event on May 9th, uh, 2024. Uh, hopefully you, you know, we talk about that. Uh, I'm pretty sure in the interview, but she's been in a therapist or someone in the community for 20 years and to serve the elderly, homeless individuals diagnosed with mental illness, as well as dual diagnosed for the past 10 years. She's worked with a state agency and she is on the board of directors of the National Alliance of Mental Illness in Central Mass called NAMI. For those of you who know it more by the nickname, a lot of our what we're going to talk about is how she loves the community and how she wants us to join together. So here is the interview. But before we go to the interview, please listen to this message from free.ai. Get free.ai. Yes, you've heard me talk about it previously in other episodes, but I'm going to talk about it again because get free.ai is just a great service. Imagine being able to pay attention to your clients all the time instead of writing notes and making sure that the note's going to sound good and how are you going to write that note and things like that. Getfree.ai liberates you from making sure that you're writing what the client is saying because it is keeping track of what you're saying and will create after the end of every session a progress note. But it goes above and beyond that. Not only does it create a progress note. It also gives you suggestions for goals, gives you even a mental status if you've asked questions around that, as well as being able to write a letter for your client to know what you talked about. So that's the great, great thing. It saves me time. It saves me a lot of aggravation and it just speeds up the progress note process so well. And for $99 a month, I know that that's nothing that's worth my time. That's worth my money. You know, the best part of it too is that uh, if you want to go and put in the code Steve50 when you get the service at the checkout code is Steve50, you get $50 off your first month. And if you get a whole year, you save a whole 10% for the whole year. So again, Steve50 at checkout for getfree.ai will give you $50 off for the first month. And like I said, get a full year, get 10% off. Get freed from writing notes, get freed from always scribbling while you're talking to a client and just paying attention to your client. So they win out, you win out, everybody wins. And I think that this is the greatest thing. And if you're up to a point where you got to change the treatment plan, well, the goals are generated for you. So get free.ai code Steve 50 to save $50 on your first month. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 150. Um, I'm very excited because I get an exclusive today. We're going to talk about a lot of different things. More importantly, on May 9, 2024, we're having a very important event that we're going to talk about. And the main organizer, who doesn't want any credit, we're going to call her Jane Doe, uh, (laughs) but really her name is Lee N. Doubleday. And um, I want to make sure I got her name right. So welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. Hi, thank you, Steve. Yeah, I appreciate you letting me come on here. So um, this is, I told you earlier, this is my first podcast or anything. So um, I'm going to be nervous. I'll let you know that for sure. So I'm going to get a little button on and goes exclusive, exclusive or something <laughs> like that. But I'm not, that, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, that advanced. But, you know, I think that one of the things that we were chatting beforehand, 
I've been removed from the Worcester community for about five or six years. I used to work at parole. I worked at probation there, helped develop uh, my former nonprofit that I worked for. We got a lot of different programs there. I started the drug court there with a with great pride or the recovery court for those. I, I hope I didn't offend anyone. It's not meant to be offensive when I say that. But she's very close to the Worcester community. But, you know, what's interesting is we never met. So mm-hmm. maybe we, you can tell me a little more about yourself and let our audience know about yourself. Sure. So my name is Leanne Doubleday. Um, I have worked in the field of mental health and human services for about 21 years now. Um, I started off, I think, just like everyone else in the field. I did the group homes. I worked in dual diagnosis program. I worked with the homeless program, nonprofits, went through the whole spiel. I think I went through the same step as anyone else in this field. And, um, you know, I've always been passionate about the field. I don't really know why. It's just very fascinating to me. Um, I love the mind. I love to figure out why people are who they are and just kind of figure out, you know, it's not just what's on paper. It's about getting to who who they are as a person. So as I got older, um, I just became more interested in just that idea of just getting to know people. Um, So currently, you know, I've been working, I work full time at an agency. We we serve the severe, chronically mentally ill. We do outreach. We do homeless outreach. Um, I've done homeless outreach with the police um, through my internship. I really love that that aspect of going out and meeting people where they're at. And like I said, I, I you know I currently do part time therapy as well. I'm trying to get my license for my LMHC. And um, yeah, I just you know I'm just really passionate about mental health, mental awareness, and just you know showing people that's okay. It's okay to talk about this stuff. It's okay to say you're not okay. It's it's all right. And I think you know I. I being who I am, I'm shy, but you know, if you talk, if you want to tell and talk to me about mental health, I can go on and on forever because it's very important. So I don't mind putting myself in spotlight for that stuff. Well, you know, it's interesting is you mentioned being shy and uh, a couple of things I want to mention on what you said. Common friend, Brian Harkins, uh, said that you were shy and you told me you're shy now. And what I felt is that you're not as shy as you say you are because you're very engaged and very passionate about mental health and a lot of different things, including the event on May 9th that we're going to have uh, 2024. So I, I, I don't I don't buy it for one second. But I also <laughs> think that we need to, you know, one of the things I feel we lose in this field sometimes is that as much as I wasn't happy to eat my crumbs in the nonprofit world, working in group homes, supported housing, crisis work, mm-hmm. parole, jail, probation, and everything else in between that I did, I think we need to eat those crumbs in order to learn this field. I don't know if you agree, but. Absolutely. You know, my first job, um, I'll I'll name it, it was at Advocates. I worked in group home. I was 22, 23 years old, just got out of college. And I can tell you, I remember every single person, every single client in that group home, Um, even though it's been that long because it was my first job. I didn't know much, but I loved it. And um, I'll, I'll throw this out, you know, my supervisor at the time is it, actually one of my best friends now, Jeanette, and we just remain in contact. It just, it just it was such a huge part of my life. So no, I absolutely agree with that. Even I actually worked for other nonprofits that it, it's just, you're learning at that point, you're excited. And even though you're not making much of anything, it's just that newness to it. Um, so I learned a lot from that stuff, that part of the world. And I think we all have to get, go through that before we go to the next step in our lives and our careers and things like that. I tried not to talk about where I started, but in 1998, I was recruited by advocates from Montreal. Oh, okay. And I worked for that organization for 15 years. And, you know, I, I, the importance of working in nonprofits, and I'm talking in general here, particularly when they're working with people with developmental disabilities, dual diagnosis, severe mental health issues, you learn so much. You learn about respect. You learn to understand mm-hmm. and you know, that curiosity that I still have to this day, I give a lot of credit to that nonprofit because why is it that way? Why is this going on? Yeah. And, but I think nonprofit work really helps us in that. Oh, absolutely. Totally agree. Um, I don't think I would be where I am without starting off that way. So, yeah. I, and I wouldn't be in this country. I wouldn't be, have two kids. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have this home. I wouldn't have the development I think I have in my life now because mm-hmm. of nonprofit. So for those of you doing your internship or listening to us and all that, well, it's nice to do private practice and do a little more of the posh stuff, uh, eat your crumbs. Cause I think that to me, that's what keeps me humble and what reminds me of where I came from and, you know, shout out to someone we both know, Tara Brennan, if you're listening, <laughs> uh, 
miss you, but someone we both know uh, from our work in the community. Yeah. And the next question is the, sa sa the same question for everyone who comes on to finding your way through therapy is, have you ever been in therapy yourself? So um, I'm stubborn. Uh, I've said this earlier. I actually, you know, I'm open to say, you know, a couple years back, it was like 2019, I was, I was struggling. Um, combination of work and home life and everything. And after probably months and months of going back and forth, I actually did seek a therapist. Um, however, I'm going to say I went one time. He was wonderful, though. Um, I would. <laughs> so he I would, fixed you on the first one. Good for you. <laughs> I, you know, I would recommend him to anyone because he was just so very kind and I was comfortable, but I was stubborn. I was like, you know what? I know this stuff. Why I need to go. Um, and honestly, I didn't, I didn't return. <laughs> so um, I tried it and I did not return. But I, I think it's just like, you know, my upbringing. Um, I, I'm Vietnamese. We don't talk about mental health in my family. I don't, you know, even now I'm in my forties. I've worked in the field for 20 plus years. My family still doesn't know what mental health is. They still don't know what I do. When I talk about it, they're like, what is this? It's just how they were raised. Um, so for me to kind of reach out for help was not, was out of the norm. What I do for a living is out of the norm as well. I'm kind of like the black sheep, so. Well, it's okay to be the black sheep. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, I'd like to talk more about culture because it does play a factor. You know, my, my, my father who knew you that I, I've been wanting to be a therapist since about age 16. My dad would uh, no longer of this world would always like, even on his deathbed, looked at me in the eye and said, let me get this straight. People pay you for <laughs> listening to their problems. Yeah. Like, no more complicated than that. Well, that's really what you're doing. I'm like, yes, dad, that's all I'm doing. So now there's a picture in my wall of my dad who watches me. So that maybe hopefully on a spiritual level, he sees what I do now, maybe doesn't think I just sit there and listen to people. Yeah. But um, I do know culture plays a huge factor. And I know that your family immigrated here from Vietnam, you said, right? Correct. Um, they came here because of the war. Um, you know, my, it was my grandparents, my parents. Um, my siblings were still young. I, I was not born yet. I was born in the United States. So my family, um, and also like cousins, big extent family in Vietnam, they lost their home. They lost their businesses. They lost everything. They were forced to leave. Um, so I don't know too much of what happened because they never really told me what happened. It was kind of like a hush-hush type deal. Um, what I do know is, like I said, they lost everything, came to America. M my mother, who is no longer here as well, um, she also lost an older child due to the, the travels and just no money, illness, things like that. But it was never discussed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they came here. What I being first born here, I didn't know any of that stuff. I My sister would say I'm spoiled um, because they wanted, <laughs> being first born here, the youngest, they wanted me to be American. You know, they wanted me to have that American dream be the, the, the example for everyone. It's a lot of pressure on me. So, you know me being in the field didn't quite help. They're like, what are you doing? You know, I was questioned left and right. What are you doing? But yeah, it, it was a challenge. Um, you know, it wasn't understood and it still isn't understood in my family, but um, you know, my, my grandparents, um, they both passed. They've been through a lot. And I remember thinking back now as I'm older, that the little things they did, I'll say, you know, my, my father, my grandfather drank a lot. Um, that's what they, he knew. He's very, was such a hard worker. Um, but I think he struggled and I don't think he knew how to, what to do. And my grandmother, same way, you know, she just cooked, make sure she took care of him, make sure she took care of the house. And that was it. Just nothing else was discussed. Um, and I think, you know, same way with my parents, when my mom was still alive, same thing, you know, I think she struggled with some depression. She had a lot of medical issues and I don't think she knew how to get help or how to talk about it. And now looking back, I wish I would have known better. I don't think I knew how to dress as a child. So yeah. I mean, you know, I, I will even challenge you as, you know, I think it's hard to address it as adults. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. like, you know, like the, there's certain family members and I'm keeping it vague while they mostly only speak French. I will still keep it vague because translation is very easy now on Google. But, you know, I have family members in Quebec that clearly could have used therapy or have, yeah. you know, could use therapy to this day. But even as a professional in this field at 48 years old, I, I find it very hard to go, you know what, uncle, aunt, cousin, do you should go to therapy. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not culturally appropriate. It's getting there, but it's not quite there even in Quebec. But I think it's hard also as an adult. I don't know if you agree, but that certainly I think is also a challenge. It is, um, you know, even now, like certain family members, like, you know, I talk about <laughs> <throw> my sister, <laughs> you know, we, she goes through some stuff and I talk about therapy 
and you know things to help her and it's just it's just a disconnect there even coming from me or I try to give her resources outside of me so that way she maybe she just needs some distance from me to talk about it. and she just yeah it's just a, a a lack of I hate to say lack of understanding but I mean if you were not raised that way to talk about feelings and that it's okay to feel like crap and talk about it and try to work through it um it's not something you can break through and you know get it done so yeah it's and it's also a challenge all right i mean it's like you know one of the things that i feel is still stigmatized in this country as well as most of the world i sh i don't want to speak for the world i'm not mm -hmm. that con not knowledgeable but i think that saying to someone you know what you need therapy has a pejorative statement it's a very much like oh my god you think i'm screwed up yeah or what have you i don't know if that's also the case for your family or in general but that's my experience with a whole lot of people Oh yeah, for sure. No, I, I always think about my grandfather. He's just a, he was just a tough man. He was just like, he ruled with an iron fist, but he got things done. And I can't imagine him just saying, oh, I need some help. You know, <laughs> it's just, it just, it's not realistic. Um, he could have used it uh, going back. I'm like, geez, you know, he was a strong man, but imagine if he got just the extra support just to see what was going on back there, you know, just to see if he needed just to talk. That, that could have done a lot for him. I, I don't know. But even for me, you know, I'm in the field. Um, I've been in the U.S. for, um, I was born here. I've been in the field for 20 plus years. I still struggled going to therapy that one time when <laughs> I said I needed it. So, you know, it's a tough one. It is. Well, how I perceive it is you should say, say to everyone, the person that you saw, because they, they secured you in one session, which is a whole lot of what people want to come to my sessions for. Like, how about you cure me in one session? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. All right. Now I know a guy. Yeah. No, uh, I meant, yeah, I felt bad afterwards. I thought about, I'm like, I hope he didn't think I hated him. Like I started going the whole story, like, oh, he thinks he's horrible. I'm like, but he was actually wonderful. It was just, um, you have to be ready. You know, I mean, anyone like 50 people can say you need some therapy, but if you're not ready, you're not ready. I think readiness is key, like you said. And more importantly, I think it's also being able to say like, you know, how, how long, like even going in your mind, I think that what I tell people is like, if you think it's going to be one week, three weeks, or three months, I mean, I can't really predict that. But I will do my best to keep it within a certain boundary. But I'm, you know, I said, I, I joked around even this week in one of my sessions. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't tell you about the wand that's in my, my, my desk. I'm going to pull it out now. You'll be fine in a week. <laughs> but I think it's also, I think that you said being ready, but also realizing that to me, mental health therapy is a lifelong challenge. And it doesn't mean lifelong every week or three times a week as the psychoanalytics would love it. But it's really about, I tell people like, I, I have a client recently who's like, I want to go to like every six months. I'm like, okay, yeah. you don't seem to be upset. I'm like, you're doing fine. If I was concerned, I'd tell you, I'm not concerned. So, you know, even with my therapist, depending on where I'm at in the seasons of my life, yeah. I see him every other week to sometimes I don't see him for like two to three months. And it's perfect for me. And it's realizing that therapy also lifting the stigma is to also realize it doesn't have to be weekly. It has to be yeah. like whatever works for the client. And it's a two-way street. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Um, it's for me, it's a work in progress, you know, because <laughs> I, I do like I do some therapy. I work at a group practice on the side and um I'm, I, I always feel you know, that, that imposter syndrome that comes up because I'm telling them, oh, yeah, you should do this, that, the other. And then I'm like looking back at myself, I'm like, oh, boy, I'm really off on what I need to do for myself, too. So, <laughs> Well, I'll encourage you to go listen to my episode 146. Or, I'm kidding. I don't remember which episode, <laughs> but around there, I did yeah. do one on imposter syndrome. Okay. And talked about how, you know, a little bit of that. And I, 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 I'll always remember a good uh, colleague of mine once said to me, you know, when people say, well, you don't know what it is to be a parent, you don't have any kids or whatever. Yeah. Well, I don't have schizophrenia yet. Somehow I can work with people with schizophrenia. So right. it's not about what you've been through, but what you've understood. And that helped me really solve a lot of my imposter syndrome. So there's your free right. therapy for the day. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> the bill will be in the mail. Oh, boy. <laughs> Don't oh, worry, I'm used to, I know you worked in a nonprofit. I'm very respectful. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll get the creditors will come after me. You'll be waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but no, you know, I think that the, the you know the culture plays a huge factor, and even like yeah. you know we we talked a little bit about Worcester, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a there's a slew of cultures in Worcester, and I, I think that people don't understand how diverse Worcester can be, yeah. you know, and I think that even in a Worcester type of situation, what I think has helped lift a lot of the stigma 
is a little bit of having access to these resources. You know, and I don't want to drop names because I know I'll forget someone and I'll get an email from Dave McMahon, you forgot this or whatever. And I love Dave. Don't, I'm not picking on Dave. But, you know, I think that that also plays a factor. I think that where you live is also something that really helps reach out or not in treatment. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're living in a small town, you're not going to get the resources or see what's out there for sure. I mean, I'll throw out Worcester. You know, there's a big Vietnamese community in Worcester. And um, I think it's it's progressing. I, I always say it's the younger kids, the younger generation that are bringing um, the mental health awareness into the forefront are, are being more open to talking about it. For myself, though, it's it's just a handful of us that work in the field. You know, I where I work, I'm the only I'm the only Asian. Let's just say that um, by going to a meeting, I'm going to be the only one. Um, in the community talking about having a therapist, I think I know maybe one or two in the Worcester community that is, that's Asian. So don't even cut it to be it's just Asian in general. Yeah. So I, you know, I tell people I'm still learning. Um, I was born here, so I don't speak the language very clearly. So I'm trying to learn better. But even seeing me and that I look like them in some way encourage them to reach out to me and they do feel more comfortable with me. So there's another therapist. Um, I'll throw his name out. His name's Mia Lee. I've known him for, for years. Um, he's an older gentleman. He's been around in the nonprofit world. And he's always trying to do something for the community, for the Vietnamese community. And he's always trying to get me on board. And I'm like, well, I am on board. I just have to figure out what to do exactly. You know, um, it's not many of us out there. Mental health is such a huge thing. And if you try to even cut it down to mental health awareness for the Vietnamese community, that's a whole other ballpark and other things that we have to put in place. Um, but yeah. It's, it's a whole another conversation there. So, and I think that you also need to keep in consideration, and this is where I feel some of these programs run by certain groups, and I'm not going to, you can figure it out. If you guys are smart, you can figure it out. If not, email me. The Vietnamese community is vastly different than a South Korean community mm -hmm. than it is from a Chinese community to a Japanese community or a Malaysian community. I know that we don't have as high numbers in those communities in Worcester, for example, Worcester, Mass., but at the same time, it's a different type of need. Mm -hmm. And I think it's sometimes lost in this like, oh, we'll help all the Asian culture by doing this. Yeah. And that's so elitist, if you ask me, but that could be my two cents. Yeah, I think it's, you know, people, I think people mean well, but people also. <laughs> You're so fucking politically correct. It's unbelievable. No, people do mean well. You know, I do. I feel like people have good hearts. I'm going to be very naive. I'm very naive when I say that. And I know that. That's not people... naive. People do ha do the best they can with what they have. Yeah, That's 100% accurate. Um, I think people just need to be a little bit more aware, though, um, and more mindful. But like I said, people mean well. They say things. And <laughs> I'm going to stop because... <laughs> All right, so let's maybe just uh, skip a little bit of that. You okay, know? we're still going there. <laughs> and, and I'll go back to culture a little bit because, sure. you know, one of the things that um, is very important is culture for me because when I'm born and raised in Quebec, my first language is French. And if you ever doubt it, make me say TH words and you'll hear it. <laughs> but all joking aside, I, I, when I hear like, oh, you know, like some people like do you, they say, well, oh, you, you, you're from Canada, you speak English. Actually, it's my second language and people don't believe me. Oh, but culture from Quebec is the same as Ontario. I'm like, no, Nova Scotia is different than New Brunswick. Never mind Quebec, who only, well, not only, but mostly speaks French from an Albertan culture that has a lot more English speakers. Mm -hmm. And then you go to Vancouver and you have a large uh, Chinese population that's way different than the Indian and the Muslim culture that you'll find mostly in Ontario and Quebec. So we got to be very mindful that we can't just put everyone in the same box and say, hey, this is how it's done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think, like I said, um, it's a challenge. I, I, I think, let's say it again, people mean well, but it's very difficult. I mean, if you, if you don't know, you don't live that, you know, if you live a certain way, you're surrounded by certain people, you're not going to know what's out there. And you're going to read about it, you're going to try to do better, but you don't really know exactly how to do it in the most appropriate manner. So, yeah. Right. Well, you know, I think people mean well. I think that openness to different information is also very, very important. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, who was not well informed in the Jewish community when I moved here, I had a client who, when doing some, um, I was doing some DBT work, the client was adamant about on Saturday, from Friday night to Saturday, you can't contact me. And I couldn't wrap my head around it until mm -hmm. it was explained to me by her and other individuals from the Jewish community about, you know, the importance of all that. Yeah, yeah.
and you know obviously I've learned and I think that you talk about people mean well I think we we need to focus on meaning well and learning because yeah. I can't know everything I still don't know anything I feel like I'm as I grow older I'm dumber and dumber in a good way <laughs> but no I think that that the cultural curiosity needs to be there yeah I'm, I'm getting better too I think I'm not scared to ask questions anymore I rather know it than me assume and then just say something completely off base so yeah, I, I usually, if I don't hear if it, it's something that I'm like, what is that? I will ask, oh, what does that mean? Or I'll go to, up to someone and be like, oh, what is that? Can you explain that to me? I'm getting better, I think, as I get older. Yeah. You know, same thing as being older, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's older evolution of individuals, but evolution of the community too. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a little bit of what, you know, I feel like even employers starting to understand that keeping the mental health, physical health of your staff is so important. Yeah. I think that cultural evolution has occurred. I think that COVID-19 kind of forced it a little bit. I think there's some regression going on, but that's my two cents. Do you, you know, do you feel like, you know, do you think that we need to put more emphasis for employers to really pay attention to employees' wellness? Oh, absolutely. Um, I always laugh with this. Um, and that's actually one of the first reasons why I, I did the May 9th, actually, was for, actually for my friends in the field. That's how it started off. You know, it, we go to different agencies, different places. They have all these signs up. Oh, you know, self-care and this, that, and the other. But yeah, it's nice. It's nice to see those signs. Nice to talk about it. But, but is it implemented? Is it encouraged? Um, do we Are we given that time to do that? Are we frowned upon if we take a mental health day? Things like that. I think it's it's getting better, but I think it could be, it could be much better than the way it is. I'll, I'll keep it as that. Especially in this field, I mean, I, I like I said, mental health. We 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 do vicarious trauma. We hear it every single day. I'm used to it, and I say that. I don't know if that's normal to say I'm used to that, but I say that very often, you know. Um, but there's some days where you know it does hit a little bit hard. I do second guess or I think about certain things that I've heard or have happened, and I just move forward. I don't even take a, a step to be like, oh, something's wrong there. And I think sometimes work doesn't get that. You know, it's um, it, it's a long time coming. Um, I think, like I said, people just need to um, have conversations more with their employees, um, see what's going on and just have yeah, a little more in-depth conversation about what's happening in people's lives. And, you know, I, I wonder how we can do that more and, you know, encourage employers to do that because I, you know, working with first responders personally, mm. that's one of the things that I encourage from, you know, and just to give a shout out to my uh, friend and who's been on my podcast many times, Jay Ball, who's like, you know, need stripes in order to be supportive of other employees that you work with. And, you know, ironically, he now has stripes. But at the end of the day, what I what I like about that message is that it's not only the employer's responsibility, it's also each other's responsibility yeah. to, to say something. Do you think that we, we, we need to support each other a little more as well as kind of put, without, I'm not talking about striking, but um, <laughs> also put the pressure on, you know, I, I turn to HR because usually mm -hmm. they're the ones who take care of that, human resources. Do we need to, as even employees, not only support each other, but also kind of like have a system where we can go to HR and say, hey, mm -hmm. you know what? Our program went through blank and I don't want to wish anything on anyone. So I'm just going to say blank. Yeah. And it was pretty hard on two of the seven members. And I know that they do the crisis intervention, stress management yeah. or critical incident stress management debriefing at a first responder world. But do you think we can find something similar in the workplace environment for different individuals? Absolutely. Um, like where I'm at, um, we, like me and my coworkers, we're very close. We have each other. Like we'll call each other, we'll text each other. Um, something's going on, we go right to each other. There's no hesitation to do that. But I do think it starts, you know, I, I think we do it, I think we do it kind of on our own time as well. Like we don't want to interrupt our work. We want to make sure we're not like taking up too much of our time to do that with each other. It's kind of this weird thing where, you know, okay, we just witnessed something. We just heard something horrible, but yet um, we're hesitating on taking 10 minutes of a break to just decompress and just be like, okay, you know, let's get together because we got to do another visit. We got to go and meet another client. I, I think it's, it, it's going to take a lot of steps. I mean, like I said, every agency, I'm going to say again, they, they do their self care trainings, they do their boards, they hang it up. But I don't know, there's the disconnect I feel there. This is why I'm going to say my end. I know for myself, I'm a community person. I work in the community. I'm boots on the ground type deal. But I think when you talk about upper management leadership, they don't do that type of work. 
um, they're not boots on the ground. So it's a little bit of a disconnect where they don't know what we see on a daily basis. They don't know the stories we hear. I get clients that call me sometimes 20, 30 times a day because um, they're struggling. But upper management leadership don't quite get that part of it either. So there is a disconnect there. And I, I think there's there has to be something done. I'm not sure what, but it's always been that way. So it's a struggle. You know, I think that you're absolutely correct. I mean, that's what I liked about my uh, the old agency I used to work for. And I remember, and rest in peace, Bill Taylor. But Bill Taylor, who ran an organization called Advocates, I'd regularly see him in the community. He mm-hmm. was the founder of and CEO, but he would come into group homes. He would go into yeah. supported housing programs. He would go into, he came to our crisis team. He came to the outpatient. And he, did he probably have as much experience as he did when he started? Of course not, because now he has other things. But he never forgot where he came from. And I think yeah. that's important for people to know, not only in our field. You know, I think mm-hmm. that having a vice president of, I don't want to pick on any particular company. We'll pick a defunct company. We'll say Toys R Us. Mm-hmm go to Toys R Us and kind of see what's going on, boots on the ground, and maybe that would help. And I, I, yeah. I think that also like, oh, you're here on a Sunday, you don't seem so good, oh, I'm having trouble, my family, da, 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 but no one can come in. And maybe having those small conversations, mm-hmm. which again, Bill Taylor used to have with us, was really, really beneficial to hear. And I think that can happen in big corporations too, if you ask me. Yeah, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big person on just being humble. Um, you know, sometimes uh, I'll think, oh, I did a great job. I know what I'm doing. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, there's a lot of people that help me there. There's a reason why I'm able to do this, that, and the other. Um, it's not that I don't give myself props for things. It's just that I'm mindful of how I got here, how I'm able to do things. And I'm, I'm a big person on thanking people. Like I'm I overly thank people, but I, but it's, it's sincere. It's genuine. I mean, I want to make sure people are heard. If you have helped me with something or you have given me something, I want to make sure, you know, I'm thankful for that. Um, so I think that's, you know, growing older too. And just being in the field, I I'm getting better at that where when I was younger, whatever, I was just doing my thing kind of in my own world. And now I'm, I'm more mindful. Like I said, looking around who's around me, why am I able to do this? Why am I here? So getting better at that. It is a balance, right? I mean, I think that we yeah. need to remain, remain humble, what brought us to this field and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But also, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing this once in a while. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, I think that if you run around telling people I'm a life savior, um, <laughs> maybe perhaps that's a little weird. Yeah. <laughs> but at the end much. of the day, it's like one of the things that I fight a lot of my first responders and a lot of my clients. Give yourself credit for what you did, but mm-hmm. stay humble. Yeah, because it's okay to do both. And I think that, you know, as a practicing Buddhist, I always talk about the middle ground. And I think that that's what employers don't understand is that someone is giving you 50, 60 hours because there's a project to be done or short staff or whatever. On the other side, it's not just the money that they're after. It's also kind of like a little bit of recognition and maybe like, hey, you know what, next week, take Tuesday off just to get back on your feet, so to speak, and give yourself a break. And yeah. and employers sometimes, and I'm not picking on any particular employers here, I think they fail to realize that most people, yes, we do it for the money, but, you know, there's an intrinsic reward, for lack of a better word, from the work we do. Oh, of course. I'm not going to say um, it doesn't make me feel good when I help someone or when someone tells me, thank you, you know, I, I made some type of difference in their lives. Of course, I feel good about it. It's not the main reason why I do it. I, I generally do enjoy solving. I don't want to say solving problems. I, I, I like to put pieces together and then something comes out of it. And then if it helps someone, that's amazing. You know, it's just, yeah. And I think that no one goes into our particular field to say that we're going to be millionaires. <laughs> except for a few and they get, you know, it's hard, hard reality. But, you know, that's why, like, for me, I like to say sometimes that I have helped a lot of people and this is how I keep myself humble. I've helped a ton of people. However, I have not changed a human being in my life. Mm -hmm. I've given them tools so they can make changes in their own lives, but I have never changed a human being. So this is my way of staying humble. Yeah, absolutely. I tell my therapy clients to, um, I say, I, I say, I'm not doing anything. I'm here. I'm listening. I'm hearing what you're saying, but you're the one who who's changing things. You're the one who's telling me that you're progressing. You're doing this, that, and the other. I did not do that. You did. Um, I might just be lending you an ear and maybe some you know, suggestions or just, um, bantering back and forth. But at the end of the day, if you're not doing it, nothing will change. So yeah, that's a good reminder for people to, um, people, you know, I think people tend to have difficulty giving themselves credit 
it's all with everyone. We are all like that. We tend to, most of us, not all of us, but a lot of us, including myself, you know, we don't give ourselves pats on the back and I don't like to talk about my stuff. I get a little like shy. I'll mention that. And the shyness is there. I get uncomfortable, but you know, that's the whole thing about learning about just appreciating what we've done and staying humble, but saying, okay, I did do a good job. It's okay to see that every now and then. I think that that's the balance that I tell people is the important to do, you know, and, it, and, you know, you see that, especially in our field, but you also see that in the first responder world, mm -hmm. in my opinion, too, is that, you know, they get an award for saving a life. The guy go, ah, yeah. you know, and, and I get that you got to do that a little bit. You don't need to go like, yep, I've saved the life. I'm the best. And it's, you know, I, I think that with employers in particular too, it's finding that balance constantly. It's not about just, you know, you want to increase revenue as an employer, protect your employees, mental health and physical yeah. health. Yeah. And even if it's a day that mm -hmm. eight hours loss of manpower or whatever the hell they call it this week is going to pay off 27, 30, 45 hour plus in work yeah. hours because people are going to be like, wow, they really cared for me. And I think that that's loss. And I think that for us as humble human beings, and I think you're right, that's encouraging our community. I also think that it's important to say, I do a good job or I do something well, because sometimes you won't hear it from your colleagues. And it's not because mm -hmm. colleagues are ill-intended. It's just like, you know, I don't, I don't see, um, I don't know about you, but I don't, you know, working in a private practice, I don't have anyone knocking on the door going, yeah. hey, by the way, you're doing a good job. Right. They don't care. They just don't. Right. And, in, and not in a bad way. This is yeah. not a picking on my clients. I'm just saying no one goes, by the right. way, you're doing a great job. They're like, yeah. I'd be like, don't fucking interrupt. Leave. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's different. Um, yeah, we don't get, I don't get that as well. I don't hear it as often. So, yeah. So just reminding yourself too that, you know, when you dismiss it, you may forget. So for me, there's also kind of like a moment where I have a few clients like per month that go, you know, that I was really helpful. And mm -hmm. I kind of remind myself, okay, I'm still helpful. Because I think yeah. it's, again, the balance mm -hmm. of not just going, I know everything versus not knowing and knowing anything versus, you know, there's always going to be something in the middle ground. So I remind myself, you know, and shout out to my clients who said, you know, that they, once in a while they're like, you know, you've really helped me. That yeah. means the world to me more than any fucking paycheck I ever get. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, Every now and then that hits you when you hear it. Yeah, it does hit you hard and you do, you know, makes you feel good and proud of what you do. So, yeah. Well, I think it might be a good place to transition to a little bit of the event on May 9th, 2024 in Worcester. Sure. Um, this is the second annual one from what I understand. Yes. So last year I decided randomly, I'm like, you know, I'm going to do something. Didn't have... <laughs> just random I, I i'm very random person i was like you know what i don't have anyone helping me what i had this idea and last year the focus is on peer recovery and mental health and um substance recovery and i had friends i knew in the community i was like you know what this is what i'm doing do you want a panel sure sure so we got a whole group together and money came out of donations um from friends family and my pocket and it was the first year so i didn't know what i was doing i'm just going for the best day by day and keeping this in mind, I do it after work and this is not work related. I'm just myself. So I did everything after hours on the weekends. Um, and it just kept building, you know, I, at first I was like, maybe this won't work. And then it just kept building. There was more interest and we ended up having it. And um, it was a good showing. Um, it, everyone was so supportive. Even people that didn't know me well were there to help. I didn't have a committee. I didn't have people saying, you know, you know, do this, that, and the other. People saw me like, okay, do you want me to stand here? Do you want me to help you with the food? Like people were just coming together and it was amazing. However, after that, I said, I would never do it again because it was so exhausting, mentally exhausting. I was tired. But um, November of last year crept up and I was like, hmm, you know, Let's figure it out again. And, um, you know, last year was a rough year for myself and a lot of my coworkers, um, my friends, and I wanted to do something for them. So last year was more about the community and the clientele that I serve. Well, this year I want it to be more for like my friends and the people that I work closely who um, are out in the community doing, doing this type of work. So initially it was something for like counselors and um, community workers. I threw in first responders because I, the last couple of years, I started having an interest in um, learning more about the responder world. Um, I did part of my internship um, doing homeless outreach with part of the CIT team in Worcester. I've had great relationships with the CIT team in Worcester, just learning about them and what they do and that them taking the time to do what they do. And it sparked some interest in me. 
So I decided, you know what, first responders and mental health workers and human service workers were different, but I'm going to try to mesh us together somehow and not insult any particular group. Um, I think it's actually meshing pretty well. You know, we have a lot in common more than people think we do. Um, there's a difference, obviously, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, we're our people. Uh, we, we see and we hear things that are very hard. And we keep moving forward. So May 9th, that's how May 9th came about. I just wanted to do something for my friends. Um, that's how it came about. I wanted to do something um, for them to realize it's okay to say you're not doing well. I wanted to find resources for them to go to. I'm stubborn. I said that I wanted out of the box resources. Um, I have like an animal therapy place coming. I have a yoga place coming. Just things that I would do if I felt kind of weird saying I want to go to therapy. Choose right. an alternative. Do a, a holistic out of the box thing. So May 9th kind of came about with that. You know, I just wanted to do something for my friends, honestly. I know you have a massage therapist coming also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Melanie's um, coming. We have just a variety of different things. We have specific first responder vendors as well. We have a couple of veterans, um, particular specific vendor vendors, um, a couple of therapy agencies. So I'm trying to, you can't have everyone, but I'm trying to make it as best of around good, good variety as possible. Um, someone who's been on my podcast before, Mr. Hanks, who talked about his story and he had a documentary will be there. I can't wait to meet to meet him face to face. I met him on mm -hmm. my podcast uh, once and just an amazing guy. And um, yes, I called him Mr. Because if you hear his story and go back to my podcast, but go to the documentary about first responders in crisis, he'll tell you a whole lot. So it's about respect. It's not about, mm -hmm. you know, anything else. And I think that first responders, just for the record, if you ever want to have, we'll have a private conversation, not obviously here, having worked with them for 20 plus years uh, in diverse, pretty much every possible way you can imagine. I like what my uh, old colleague said, they're social workers with guns. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, especially yeah, you the know, CIT guys, but anyway. Yeah, I agree because, you know, like I said, I did, I wanted to start off with just me and my, like, I want to do it for my friends. I have a couple of people that I consider close to me who are friends who are on the CAT team or have been on the CAT team or have done um, extra in the police department. I thought of them, you know, I've heard of their struggles, like day, day in and day out, their boots on the ground. I've seen their interactions with the community and it's amazing. You know, I know police, there's a lot of scrutiny right now, but these, th these are the people that I know and I've worked closely with and I see what they've done and how they treat people. And I can't say anything else negative about that. So there's a couple of people, I'm not going to name names, but I, you know, I, I thought about them as well. You know, I wanted them to be able to have a voice. Um, when I started this, initially I wanted Worcester to be involved, uh, whether it's fire department or police, but then I, the more I went on, it, it's not easy, you know, to have an event, talk about mental health in your town. Now that I think back of it, I'm like, what was I thinking? But, you know, I, I think even though I don't have any locals on the panel, um, I think it's still going to make a big difference to hear like Brian speak or to hear, um, you know, John Monahan, who was the chief of police speak. I think it's going to make a big difference. And even if they're not going to say that they're there to get the help, if they do come, um, they can walk around, see what's out there. It's going to be confidential. They can see what's out there, talk to a couple people and grab a couple brochures or resources. And, you know, hopefully that makes some type of difference. Well, I'll I'll be there, obviously, and that's yeah. part of why I'm promoting it to myself. And um, you'll definitely be able to find my table. I will talk about my group that I do for first responders, among other work that I've done in the community in regards to first responders. So it, it's an opportunity. What I found with first responders is that this newer generation, and I mean the younger generation of police officers, are much more open to mental health and I'm not picking on the older generation. I have like, mm -hmm. I can name 12 chiefs right now off the top of my head that are absolutely like, Hey Steve, I got a guy I need, needs help or a yeah. woman who needs help because it's not gender neutral, like both men and women work in the, in the field. And uh, I say guy by default. So please understand. And I think that seeing tables, seeing that there's an openness to getting the help and all that, I think that that's key for first responders to hear too. Yeah. Yeah. I emphasize that, you know, I wanted, besides just having vendors uh, or tables there with people behind the tables talking to you, I actually, I've been emphasizing having a table just separate on its own with brochures and information. So if you did not want to encounter anyone or talk to one, walk up, take a brochure or take a picture of what you see there and no one's going to notice. You're just going to go there and do it. And I, I want to be as mindful as possible on just, you know, if you're not comfortable, 
how can I make it to be a little bit more comfortable so you can get that resource and maybe it will help you somehow. So that's my goal. Um, so, yeah. Well, I'll join your goal when I'm there on, again, give the dates. Sure. It's May 9th. Um, it's at the St. Bernard's Church in Worcester on 236 Lincoln Street. Um, it's gonna, we're going to open the doors at 5 for the vendors. We're going to have some comfort dogs there, um, all the vendors, some food. And then we're going to start the panel discussion around 630. There's plenty of parking. We're able to get the church parking lot and the two parking lots next door. So there'll be signs up. So there'll be plenty of parking, no street parking needed. I don't even think we need street parking that day. Um, but yeah, it's a free event. And like I said, it's just to support the community, support your friends, whoever's in the field, and it's open for everyone. And I think that what's awesome about it too, is we have resources in Worcester, but a lot of the vendors are outside of Worcester. So it's a big variety of um, around the state. Um, so if you didn't want to get help in the Worcester area, you want a little distance, we have places out further, um, you know, that you don't feel like, oh, someone's going to see me, someone's going to know me. Um, so I did really try to get a good variety of people there. Well, I can't wait. I saw the list. And uh, if you go to my uh, Facebook page, you will see all the vendors that are listed, among other things. I'm very excited to be there. Can't wait to meet you face to face. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll see Brian. I haven't seen Brian in a long time. I'm going to get to see Keith, which is going to be cool. Uh, I know a lot of the vendors and hopefully it'll be people I know. But more importantly, if I can help or offer resources to one individual while I'm there, it's way beyond what I hope I can do. Um, yeah. I really, I really I think that that's what people that I saw on the list, they're not looking to save the world. They're looking to save one person. If you, and uh, to quote, I believe is Aristotle, save one person, save the world. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I had said that to something else too. Uh, even if I said, even if, if five people came to this event and that was all I got and one person got help from it, then that's the point, isn't it? It is the point at the end of the day. So I'm okay with that. Uh, all I want to be, I think we all want is a community that is healthier, knows that mental health resources are available if they don't need them right away, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we're able to move forward in that people remember that, then I think that it's beyond the gift that you're giving with this second annual event, which I truly appreciate that you're doing. Oh, thank you. And like I said, it wouldn't happen without people volunteering their time. This is people just saying, I want to do it. You know, I just asked and they said, sure, why not? So all the panelists that we have on board, all the vendors, a couple of my friends are coming there just to support, just to help me guard the door and the food. Like this is, it wouldn't happen without people saying, you know, I'm going to take my time and do this. I believe in it. Um, it wouldn't happen without them. So I appreciate everyone's support in this too. Well, maybe it's time to be less humble and accept, as we said earlier in the podcast, thanks to you, this event will occur. And don't forget that either. And I know that that's uncomfortable for you. <laughs> I'm going to shut you off right now. <laughs> I thought she was going to hang up, actually. Um, <laughs> but she didn't. But So if you want to see her face change on YouTube, <laughs> oh, it'll be available on YouTube. She was all smiles, and I gave her credit, and her face went, hmm. So, okay. <laughs> But from the bottom of my heart, not even knowing you, but knowing the work you've done, where you've worked, and everything else that you've done, thank you. And, you know, it's okay for you to accept the thank you. All joking aside, I will contribute in any way, shape I can, shape or form I can, because I, I truly believe in that. And that's, you know, it's a tribute not only to you, but the community work that you do. So if it's hard for you to be humble and accept it for yourself, accept it for the community. So thank you. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, actually. So I feel a little better when you say it that way. I can't say anything against that. So I appreciate that. All right, so she's going to have a new therapist. It'll be me. Uh, but uh, please uh, join us on May 9th. I'll be there. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Steve, for having me on. Well, this concludes episode 150. Leon, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Come on May 9th, 2024, Worcester. It's going to be a great time. I, I can't wait. But um, episode 151 is Courtney Romanowski, who will be taking over as the host. So I can't wait to hear what she's going to talk about. And I hope you join me then. Please like, subscribe, and follow this podcast on your favorite platform. A glowing review is always helpful. And as a reminder, this podcast is for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. If you're struggling with a mental health or substance abuse issue, please reach out to a professional counselor for consultation. If you are in a mental health crisis, call 988 for assistance. This number is available in the United States and Canada.